I am a composer, but I also spent uh, a good amount of time working in biology research. Now, what does music composition have to do with biology research? Well, creativity. Scientific um, research requires an incredible amount of creativity to, in order to peer into that mighty unknown and see if you can find something that no one else has ever conceived before. In scientific research and experimentation, we look toward the constraints of a system, right? Or even impose constraints on a given system so that we can see how that system responds to those constraints. Creative people working in creative fields are also dealing with limitations and constraints all the time, though they're often not even aware of it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is limitations, because they should be your best friend. Now, anyone out there who's in a creative field has probably encountered at some point someone who's had writer's block. Anyone out there had writer's block? I certainly have, yes. Um, probably worse than most of you. Um, so I want to share with you uh, a little advice that um, has made a big difference for me in overcoming um, that, creative, that barrier to my creativity, and that is that the limitations set you free. Now, I didn't come up with that. I learned it from one of my big heroes, the great 20th century firebrand composer, Igor Stravinsky, who famously said that limitations set you free. The more art is controlled, limited, worked over, the more it is free. Hmm, interesting. Okay, now Stravinsky talked of the terror he felt when facing the infinitude of possibilities and of his fear of falling into the abyss of freedom. So I didn't come up with this, but I do really practice it all the time in my own work, and I'm always emphasizing it to my students. Let's give a little listen to Stravinsky's most important um, and uh, well-known work, part of the Rite of Spring. And that is only one small chunk of this massive, terrifying, and totally earth-shattering work. But limitations? This music sounds totally out of control. How is it that this wild, totally unhinged music, um, how does it relate to control and limitations? Well, the answer to that is probably um, pretty complicated for the tight time constrictions that we have for a TED Talk, so I'll respond to that limitation by uh, choosing metaphor instead to describe it. So you all remember from algebra that a simple one-factor equation will yield a simple line, whereas a complex multivariable equation will yield a more complex line. So complex rules yield more complex results. And Stravinsky lived in a complicated time, and he was a complicated guy, and he wanted intense, complicated music, so he chose complicated rules and lots of them. And he went so far as to say that the more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself of the chains that shackle the spirit. So, what I want to do today is take a close look at what Stravinsky meant by this uh, notion that the limitations set us free. And then I'll show you some examples of how limitations have driven me creatively in my own work. Most importantly, how they can set you free in your work and how you can turn your restrictions, barriers, and challenges into your creative best friend. So in order to do that, why don't we start with a little exercise? What if I were to ask you to write a paragraph on anything? One that I could read out to everyone right here. It's a little hard. You have to think back over all the things that have been on your mind in the last few days. Think about which is the best one, right? What's the best one I should write about? Hmm, maybe it's that one, maybe it's the other one. No, maybe it was that one in the first place. You bounce back and forth. A lot of artists have talked about the terror of the empty canvas, right? Where on earth do you start? What do I do? And then you just throw up your hands. Well, what if I were to ask you instead to please write a three-sentence paragraph about hippopotamuses? Hmm. Now, well, there's something. 
I have to confess that I probably don't have more than three sentences worth of knowledge about hippopotamuses, so this is starting to sound quite right for me. I can probably match those two things together. So I gave it a try. Hippos are enormous, weighing upwards of one ton, and when living in captivity require huge tanks for proper habitation and nourishment. Their diet consists entirely of aquatic plants, and in the wild, they can pose a danger to humans encroaching on their territory. All right, well, there is something. Um, it sounds like a placard at the zoo, right? Nothing special about it. Probably, if you turn to your left and right, you'd probably find that the other people who had completed that project had something that wasn't remarkably different from that, right? But at least you got it done, right? At least, at least you got it done. However, what if I were to ask you to please write a three-sentence paragraph describing hippopotamuses that does not use any word that refers to their size nor the letter N? Well, now we're talking because, hmm, that sounds kind of challenging and kind of, is it possible to do something like that? I'm not even sure. Let's maybe give it a try. Let's look back at the old one. We had rather a lot of ends and we had several references to size, so I think we're going to need to rework it rather heavily. And that's what I did. I came up with one rather quickly. It's not the greatest thing in the world, but listen to it. Captive hippos require vast aquatic spaces to move comfortably as well as to feed. They eat solely water flora. Close proximity to populous locales may create hazards. There's no ends in there, and I don't think there are any references to size, right? Okay, uh, so we did it. And like it or not, it's weird and kind of interesting, right? And if you were to turn to your left and right and compare yours to what your neighbors did around you, you'd probably find it was really different. And why is that? Because when you have to respond to limitations, we all respond to those limitations in very different ways. And because I put a couple of limitations, three limitations on there, there's three points where you can start to diverge from your neighbors, right? Okay, so what have these limitations done for us? They have gotten us over the writer's block. They got the pen going. Once we saw a satisfying task where we could match what we knew to what was asked for, it was enticing to complete that. So we got through that writer's block. However, Perhaps more importantly, it helped us create something unique, right? That second one was certainly unique. Um, strange, but unique. So these two things can happen. So I want to talk a little bit about limitations in my own work, and they fall into two rough categories. I think of them as the external limitations and the self-imposed limitations. For the external limitations, it's things like the stipulation from the commissioner, the person who asked me to write the work. Um, how long does this work need to be? When do you need it by? These things matter. You know, these are, I'm going to make decisions based on this stuff. There's also the instrumental ensemble available, which might be a part of that. You know, is it orchestra? Is it solo trumpet? Is it classical guitar duo? Then there's the space where the music it will be performed. Is this going to be an outdoor concert? Because if it is, it better be really loud or you won't hear any of it. Is it going to be in a very resonant cathedral with lots of echo? Because if it is, you better not write a lot of changing up things because it's just going to sound like mud. And then there's also the nature of the audience. Is this a piece for a highly specialized audience of connoisseurs of chamber music? Or is this a piece for the theater where there's a broader range of interests out there? There's also technical limitations. Does this piece involve any equipment or software or anything like that? And if so, what are those limitations? I need to know about them, think about them. Okay, then there's also self-imposed limitations. These are the fun ones that I make myself. Now, I'm kind of crazy about games, number games, and rules, and patterns, and fractals, and things like that. Nothing fancy, just, you know, I'm not a mathematician, just composerly type of interest in these things. And I really like rounds and cannons. Okay, now we all know what rounds are. Rounds are, you know, row, row, row your boat. 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 And the amazing thing about that is that it's the exact same music. Everybody is singing the same music, right? Except that it has been offset by that four beat pattern, right? It's offset. It's the same music. Self-similarity offset. And that basic principle is what has inspired composers for well over a millennia. How far do we offset? By how much? What are we offsetting? Is it just time or is it time and pitch? Is it time and space? Um, is it time reversed? All different kinds of possibilities for canon. But you can also build a piece upon something that's fixed, like a uh, pre-existing text, like a poem, uh, or a uh, musical element. You can actually build a piece onto another piece of music, as I'll talk about.
you can create or choose a certain technical scenario that has its own limitations and then respond to those limitations. Okay? So I'll talk to you about one of my pieces, Compose Thyself. I was asked to write a piece of music that would incorporate one of the cantatas of Johann Sebastian Bach. Now Bach, who's a musical god for me, wrote um, hundreds of these cantatas, so many that a good number of them were actually lost forever, either entirely or partially. And for me, this was kind of enticing as a composer because I'm not a um, musicologist who wants to recreate those missing parts in the style of Bach because that's really intimidating and presumptuous to even try to do something like that. But I'm a composer and I want to, I loved the idea of having my music intermingle with that of Bach's. And I found a fantastic one. It was a piece that had once been commissioned and performed, but had since been lost entirely except for one part, the soprano's solo line, the solo soprano's line that went throughout the entire thing. 10 movements of music, over 25 minutes of music, but just that one thread of it, and that's all there is. That was the perfect thing for me to build my work around so that my music and box could flow together. Now, what to put there? That's the problem, right? So I went to that line, I dissected it, took it apart, analyzed it for several days, singing it, playing it, diagramming it, using colored pencils, everything, until I finally zeroed in on the DNA of that line. And it was something very small, very specific. It was a four note scale. Re, do, si, la. That was it. It was everywhere in this melody line. It was on the structural level. It was on the, on the small level, on the medium level. It was everywhere. And so there was my answer. And from that point, every musical decision that I needed to make about this piece, I came back to that DNA. And so what is that DNA telling me about what I need to do next? And so what this led to is I took this, uh, I could take this little cell and I could use it in all the realms of, of the music making, I could, um, I could turn it into the harmony by piling those notes on top of each other. I could use it to create the larger architecture of my piece over time. Um, I could even use it for instrumental choices, rhythmic choices, all kinds of things like this. And here's a little of it. on to the next piece that I want to talk about, a piece I wrote called Latency Canons. I decided I wanted to work with, a, with American Composers Orchestra to create a piece where we would play with another ensemble, but not in the same room, instead over the internet, far away. And we were working with a group called Gildas Quartet, who was in Manchester, England, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so obviously the internet. But there's a problem. It was going to premiere at Carnegie Hall, where it, it, this is not a high-tech Internet 2 facility like in some kind of university sound lab or something like that. So what's the solution to that problem? Well, just use a Google Hangout, right? It's free, and you can try it at home if you like as well. So we did that. But there's a problem with Google Hangouts and all of those free software is that there are Internet delays and glitches that you wouldn't have in the high-tech stuff, right? So those delays and glitches, um, you know, the delays, are, they're also called, you know, they're called latency, those delays. They can be anything from almost unnoticeable to like several really frustrating seconds. But what if we use that as an opportunity to renew the idea of canon, right? So that time offset, that four beat time offset of row, row, row your boat, what if instead of a four beat time offset, our time was offset by this unstable delay that we get on the internet, which in itself is unstable because it's determined by the overall traffic on the internet at that given moment when that piece is happening right there and now. And it's all a sum factor of all that human activity on the internet. And for me, that was really appealing. And that led me to think about ideas of things like distance, time, Connectivity, how amazing it is to be able to be in contact with people on the other side of the ocean. Connection, to be playing music with people on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean that I to this day still have not met in person was inc incredibly moving to me. So that current humanity, but also the ancientness 
of this technique that we're carrying forward into the 20th century. And it sounds to me like sort of like a cathedral, this resonant cathedral, but it's a cathedral that wraps around the world really in a way, right? And then my latest project is one where I decided about a year ago that I thought it would be fun to come up with little low stakes creative exercises for myself, but I wanted them to actually be something that I could kind of get out there, that show people, because once you put something in the light of day, you, you re relate to it differently. So um, I thought about, well, I have an Instagram account that I was barely using at the time. Um, maybe I'll just use that and uh, post them there. I don't have that many friends, so it's very low stakes. Um, but the problem with that was uh, that there's this 15 second time limit, really, really short. Wow. Well. What about 15 second compositions? Is it possible to create a meaningful musical statement in just 15 seconds? That became the challenge for this project, but there's another limitation. Audio without video will never get heard, never get listened to online, right? We all know it, you know, you'll move on to the next one because there's something to look at, right? Um, so that was a problem and I'm not a video artist, so I don't really know what to do there, but I decided what about just going for it? What about just making do anyway? This opened up its whole own new world of limitations and restrictions. For one, everything has to be homemade. There's no budget for this project at all. So everything's gonna be, the music will come from instruments I have in my studio, friends who work with me, recordings I've made of friends that they allow me to use, and all these things sort of recombined into pieces, right? On the video end of things, it would have to come from you bet, this here, this little phone, and what the, the few effects it has on it, and the few places that I go and the things that I see. That's where it all comes from. Except in this case, where I was able to work with my longtime collaborator, my animator brother, John Lustig, who let me use his video to make one. Because limitations for a given situation are almost never the same as for any other situation, doesn't it make sense that responding to those specific limitations you're being forced to get away from what's been done before, right? And if you are, wouldn't Stravinsky emphasize to you that the more limitations you're responding to, the further you're getting away from the norm? So here's what I want you to do. Notice when you're stuck. We don't always see it. Actively look to the limitations, the constraints, and especially the ones that frustrate you to see if you can somehow embrace them, turn them around, make them into the very soul of your work. And then, if there aren't enough limitations, and there are never enough, make up some more of your own. Embrace them, work with them, let them work for you, and enjoy what comes of it. Good luck.